Welcome, and thank you for joining the World Affairs Council of Connecticut today to discuss the Iran deal. Should it be revived, renegotiated, or rejected altogether? With special guest, Dr. Trita Parsi. Dr. Parsi is Executive Vice President of the Quincy Institute for for Responsible Statecraft, and he is an expert on U.S.-Iranian relations and author of three books on U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. Uh, Trita, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me again. Pleasure to be back. My name is Amanda Jolly, VP of Programs at the Council, and today's structure will kick off with a conversation with Dr. Trita Parsi and Megan Torrey, CEO of the World Affairs Council of Connecticut. Uh, We are honored to have Trita here today with us to discuss how the U.S. and Iran will navigate the rocky road ahead, and ultimately, if the deal will be recovered, renegotiated, or rejected. Uh, So now let's get started. I'm pleased to turn over to you, Megan. Megan Torrey, CEO of the World Affairs Council. Thank you so much, Amanda. Welcome everybody to State of the World. Um, it is such an, a pleasure to have you back on State of the World, Trita. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me again. We have so much to talk about today, so let's dive right in. After the last four years, let's talk about what the Biden administration is inheriting. Where do U.S.-Iranian relations uh, stand right now? The Biden administration is inheriting a very, very bad situation, clearly not just on Iran, but on a whole set of issues. Afghanistan is another one, for instance. But if we focus now on Iran, uh, is inheriting a situation in which the United States violated the nuclear agreement, violated the UN Security Council resolution that embodied the agreement, has been uh, sanctioning not just Iran, but the Russians, the Chinese, some Europeans, etc., for actually trying to abide by the nuclear deal. In addition to that, uh, we have seen that it also has imposed sanctions and other measures to deliberately make it as difficult as possible for the Biden administration to go back into the nuclear deal. So that's the starting. Then we have a context in Iran in which uh, an increasing number of people in Iran are starting to turn away from the JCPOA, feeling that they got completely Um, uh, screwed over by the United States here because of Trump leaving. Uh, At the end of the day, the Iranians are under more sanctions now when they actually signed the JCPOA than they were before the deal even was struck. And on top of that, uh, we're seeing a situation inside the country in which they will have their elections in June, which means that by sometime mid-March, effective negotiations are going to be extremely difficult, if not impossible to do, because they're in the middle of their Uh, presidential elections. That leaves the administration with just a few weeks to be able to orchestrate uh, some form of a return for the United States. And I think it's important to keep in mind that while the Biden administration has been insisting that the Iranians need to move first, um, and we can get into the dynamics of that, reality is that the Iranians are not outside of the deal. They have reduced some of their obligations to the deal using one of the paragraphs uh, that allows them to do so. The U.S. completely left the deal. So when you see the perspective of many of the others in the P5 plus one, you know, the U.S. is the entity that needs to be able to get back into the deal. Now, how it happens, who moves first, et cetera, you can deal with that issue. But the core issue is that the U.S. a month into Biden's presidency is still outside of the JCPOA. So, Trina, you were involved, um, you know, at a high level in the negotiations of the JCPOA in, in 2015. Um, how do you think negotiating uh, the negotiating table would be different um, this time around? Where do you start? So uh, just one clarification. I was advising the uh, administration on the negotiation. I was never actually uh, a participant in the negotiations. I think there's some very significant differences now that have to be taken into account. On the one hand, several years have passed. Uh, which means that by now we should have been in a situation in which more confidence and trust should have been built between the different countries because all of them should have been abiding by the agreement. That's how you build trust. It's not to say that the deal is built on trust, but the deal should have helped build some trust, meaning that after several years of Iran complying, the U.S. complying, It would have made it easier to start addressing other issues, perhaps even addressing some of the nuclear issue to tighten the deal if there's a desire to do so. We're in the opposite situation. There is more mistrust now between the U.S. and Iran than there was before as a result of what Trump did. And I do have to add, I think the Biden administration inadvertently committed some mistakes that even fuel that further. Because by starting to talk about that it's on the Iranians to move first, 
uh, even if that was a, just a completely honest, genuine desire from the US side to see that happening, that the Iranians should take the first step, whether that is frankly morally or legally or politically defensible is a different issue. But what it did is that it actually fueled the Iranian fear that actually, you know what? Biden is not serious about diplomacy because he's trying to play for time and then use the Trump sanctions that he still has not lifted as leverage to get more concessions out of Iran. The Iranian fear of going back to the table in the sense of talking to the US without the US first lifting the sanctions is that if the Iranians do so, and then it turns out that the talks don't work, whether it's because of Biden or something else or because of the Iranians, well, then the Iranians are gonna get blamed for the collapse of the talks, even though the US never actually returned to the deal. The US left the deal, never returns to the deal, but Iran gets the blame. So that's why they've been insisting that the US needs to return to the deal before there can actually be any further discussions. On top of that, then Biden comes and says, no, you have to move first. And that then tends to fuel the Iranian suspicion that perhaps Biden is not sincere. I think Biden is sincere, but in a context in which you have so little trust to begin with, it is simply not sufficient to think that the US's moral standing or trust has been restored simply by the US changing presidents. It is not that easy. We cannot just simply wash away what has happened in the last four years by saying that we have a new president right now. And so I think inadvertently a mistake has been committed there that has actually aggravated the situation. So let's talk a little bit about um, the impact of sanctions on, on Iran and the maximum um, pressure campaign. Uh, you know, how did that impact uh, what we're looking at today? The sanctions had a devastating impact on the Iranian economy. Um, I mean, the Iranian economy, economy has more or less completely been cut off from the rest of the world. They are selling oil uh, with countries that are willing to risk getting sanctioned by the U.S. The bottom line is nowhere near what it was before. And on top of that, when the pandemic hit, the U.S. tightened the sanctions even further and explicitly talked about the COVID uh, pandemic as something that actually could augment and uh, uh, accelerate the impact of the sanctions. So we're now using pandemics and illnesses as a way of pressuring the country, which shows again, uh, this is not, no one can make an honest claim that this is a sanctions regime focused on the government. This is a sanctions regime that just hits blindly the entire society. And that is what's happened. It's ordinary people that are suffering from this. And what really makes it worse is that it's not just the pain and the economic suffering, it's the economic pain and suffering combined with the, com with the expectation that the Iranians had or where they would have been now had the US actually abided by the deal. So they set their expectation that the econ economy is gonna go in a positive direction, that in by now, the economy in Iran would be in a much better shape, unemployment would be down, inflation would be down. Instead, the situation is worse than what it was before the JCPOA was uh, negotiated. So the expectation gap is massive. And we do know that when um, a lot of destabilizing things happen in societies, including revolutions, it tends to coincide with a massive expectation uh, gap. Now, that was incidentally part of the objective of the Trump administration. They were hoping that this will foment unrest in Iran and bring about the collapse of the Iranian government. It has fomented unrest, but it has done exactly what a lot of experts predicted. It would just cause the Iranian government to be even more brutal in its repression in order not to collapse. And now, four years later, Trump is gone, but the Iranian government is still there. But it is more brutal than it was four years ago. So I'm going to bring in a question um, that someone has just asked on Facebook. So Alonso has asked, um, what has the impact of the killing of Qasem Soleimani um, had on the, the longer term relationship between the U.S. and Iran? Um, and then do you think that the Iranians will sort of uh, in, include this issue in negotiations, some assurance that um, these sort of dramatic acts won't, won't, ha won't happen in the future? I think it's difficult to say what the long-term effect will be uh, because we still haven't seen it. Clearly, it's not going to make things any easier, and particularly if the Iranians then um, uh, implement what they have promised to do, which is that they're going to uh, exact the revenge on him, uh, but they're not just going to do it right now. They're going to patiently wait. Uh, 
well, then that could be just a ticking bomb that is going to set off another crisis. So we, we still don't know exactly what it's going to do. I do think that if the JCPOA is returned and then there are add-on negotiations, which at least was the original plan of the Biden administration, the Biden administration is going to raise a whole set of different issues and they want to tighten certain aspects of the deal. They want to lengthen certain aspects of the deal. Iran is going to come back with a massive amount of demands as well including economic compensation for the economic pain they have suffered as a result of U.S. sanctions that were contradictory to international law because they violated the U.S. Security Council sanction. The Iranian foreign minister threw out just early this week that the sanctions have cost the Iranians $1 trillion. I am not sure if that is the case. Uh, it's kind of fascinating because in the past, the Iranian official line was to downplay the impact of the sanctions, and the U.S. government line was to upplay overplay how impactful the sanctions have been. Now it seems like we may end up in a situation of complete reversal. The Iranian is going to play it up in order to make a case for compensation and the US side will play it down because they don't want to enter into, um, or at least they don't want to provide that degree of compensation. So there's going to be a whole set of other issues that are going to have to be dealt with. We can't even get to a single one of them unless the JCPOA is first restored with the US going back into it. So that's the key to be able to not only address other nuclear issues, uh, situation uh, concerns the Iranians may have, but also regional issues and other bilateral dialogues that the US and Iran should have on a whole set of issues, including human rights. None of it can happen because if the JCPA collapses completely, and if Biden doesn't return, the Iranians are not gonna engage in other negotiations. They will just draw the conclusion and politically will be very difficult for them that there really isn't much of a utility of, with dialogue with the United States. And that would be the wrong conclusion for them to draw. It would be wrong for us to lead them to draw that conclusion in my view. Let's talk about the nuclear issue. So we know that after the um, the U.S. pulled out of the JCPOA, um, Iran began enriching uranium above the 3.67 percent, um, and it's gained expertise from research and development on, on advanced centrifuges. Do you think um, it's even realistic to think Iran would be willing to give up these developments? Yes, absolutely. Because if the Iranians really wanted to leave the deal, they should have just done it back in when Trump left the deal and they had a completely uh, legitimate excuse to do so. Instead, they stayed in the deal, but they used an element and paragraph in the deal that allowed them to reduce their obligations, which is not a good thing, but the deal allowed them to reduce their obligation if one side wasn't performing. And the U.S. completely stopped performing by leaving the agreement. If the Iranians just wanted to do this, I mean, they could have had a perfect excuse to leave it back then. The fact that they've stayed, despite all of these sanctions, and have committed themselves to the vast majority of the obligations, um, I think is a clear indication they want to see it revived. And even the measures they have taken, they have all been very clearly things that are easily reversible which means that if the U.S. goes back into the deal, the Iranians can within weeks make sure that all of the extra MEU is shipped out, um, that they go back to 3.67% instead of enriching at higher levels. These are easy things to reverse. When it comes to the research, they were actually allowed to do additional research um, uh, according to the deal, but they were not allowed to use those centrifuges for enrichment because that would dramatically shorten their breakout capability. And to the best of my knowledge, they have not started using those centrifuges, but that could be another step that they would take. Um, and, and it would be very bad, but that's all the more reason for us to quickly go back into the deal because that's how we fastest and best reverse all of those measures. We have a few questions that deal with sort of Iran's um, broader role in the region. So you recently wrote in Foreign Affairs that Riyadh and Abu Dhabi have less interest in strengthening the nuclear deal than in sustaining the enmity between the U.S. and Iran. Can you expand on that? Why would Saudi and UAE's interests be in, in opposing the deal? So uh, during the negotiations, I quote one of the negotiators who's now uh, recommended to be Deputy uh, Secretary of Defense in the Biden administration. He was an advisor to Biden during the talks, uh, Colin Cal. One of my interviews with him for my book uh, on the talks, he said, you know, the Saudis never came and asked, you know, bring in, make sure that the Iranians have less centrifuges or a longer um, restrictions on this or that measure. The argument was simply, how can you make a deal with that country, with that regime? So it wasn't the details of the deal that was important. It was the very idea 
that there would be an agreement between the United States and Iran. So why is that? They're not wrong. I think they see a reality that um, is problematic. Part of the reason why the JCPA was important was because it would prevent a war between the United States and Iran and would enable the United States to start shifting its focus eastwards towards China and other much more pressing challenges that the Obama administration had identified that the Biden administration have reinforced. So in order to be able to extract the United States militarily from the region, which is clearly what the majority of Americans want, you needed to first make sure you did not get dragged into another war. Secondly, you needed to make sure that you had a somewhat of a functioning relationship with a major country in the region, which was Iran. If that were to happen and the US were to withdraw from the region militarily, what would the impact of that be? Well, it would allow for the balance of power in the region to shift in a direction that is not in the interest of the Saudis and the Emirates. They have enjoyed a very beneficial balance of power as a result of the US putting its big military finger on the scale in their favor. The balance that currently exists, they could never have achieved through their own means. It's only achieved because of the fact that the US is a superpower. So I think it's fully understandable that from their perspective, they don't wanna lose this massive, massive benefit that the United States has provided them. But at the end of the day, it is also not the job of the United States to underwrite their security and underwrite a favorable balance of power for them indefinitely, particularly when the United States has its own concerns and its own interests that it needs to attend to. And one of those interests is not to get dragged into a war with Iran. Another interest is to see how do we deal with China, which is a major power that is rising. So I, the point I was trying to make in that, art, in that piece is that I think it's actually very important to bring in the Saudis and the Emiratis into regional dialogue with the Iranians, not into the nuclear deal, because I think they have made it very clear that they prefer there not to be a deal at all. But if the nuclear deal is restored, then I think we cannot have a regional dialogue on Persian Gulf security forces if the Saudis and the Emiratis are not there. But we need to first make sure that we address their incentive structure as long as they think that they can keep the United States engaged or in my word, use of language, trapped in the Middle East, then that's what they will opt for. And they will not have the incentives to engage genuinely uh, in diplomacy in the region. Once it becomes absolutely crystal clear that the US is gonna shift that, it may take five years or 10 years, but we are going to have to attend to American interests first. That's when I think you will see these countries realize that their second best option is to engage diplomatically and resolve their problems with Iran. Iran is gonna to have to compromise with them, but they too will have to compromise with Iran. And that's what also allowed the United States to actually play the role of a peacemaker rather than play the role of the belligerent, a belligerent, because that is the role that we have played in the region for the last 20 plus years. So a question about from Ken about the ongoing civil war in Yemen and uh, Iran's support for the Houthis. Do you think that this is a sticking point for negotiations? Do you think that this will be addressed going forward in I, uh, the upcoming negotiations? Yep. I think if, again, if they strike, if the U.S. returns to the JCPOA, Iran is in complete compliance. Some of these measures that they have taken lately are reversed then absolutely, I think the agenda actually is to start talking about Yemen and other regional issues. And frankly, on Yemen, that's where the uh, promise for some progress is the greatest. Um, and, and, and things can be achieved there and they must be achieved there because of uh, the horrible humanitarian situation there, which you know all of these countries have contributed to. Iran has contributed to it. Saudi Arabia certainly has contributed. And rest assured, the United States has also contributed to it because we have helped the Saudis in their bombing campaign. We have helped them to blockade the country that is the cause of the mass famine that is now existing there. But again, it doesn't seem very likely that we can get to those negotiations until we first make good on our signature on the JCPOA and have that fundamental situation in which there is a, a perception on all sides that diplomacy actually can achieve something. That perception will not exist if the United States spends years negotiating a new deal, then uh, quits it, and then the next administration does not uh, go back into it in a timely fashion. 
I have a question from John about um, the impact of the sanctions in, in the isolation of Iran. Do you think those helped contribute to um, sort of the Abraham Accords, this sort of, you know, is it normalizing relationships between Israel and some of the Gulf states? I think it may have had some contribution. Well, it's not the sanctions. I think tensions between Iran and Saudi Arabia and um, uh, UAE and Israel have created a commonality. I think that commonality between those three countries is actually um, less to do with Iran than with another factor. And I've already alluded to it earlier on. If it was all Iran, then we would have seen UAE's foreign policy act accordingly, meaning that if they were willing to take what Netanyahu himself called an unimaginable step of normalizing, uh, because of the threat from Iran, then we would have seen a different conduct of the UAE vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Instead, you know who the UAE is most engaged against in the region, where who it is mostly fighting? It's mostly fighting Turkey and the Muslim Brotherhood. And that is what the UAE himself has, uh, themselves have defined as their main challenge. So I don't think, I, I'm not in any way, shape or form denying that the Iran factor is very much there. I don't think it has been the leading factor. I think the leading factor that really unites the Saudis, the Emiratis, and the Israelis, again, is what I mentioned earlier on, the desire for the United States to stay militarily in the region and provide the security umbrella and a beneficial balance of power that has been the case for more than 25 years now. That's what's really binding them together. Because if, and, and that's why you see the UAE agreeing to this deal if they get F-35s. What does it mean for the UAE to get f 30 are they gonna use them very effectively? I mean, we see how much the Saudis are spending on American weaponry and they haven't managed to defeat the Houthis who are far less uh, armed than what the Saudi military is. You buy these very, very advanced American weaponry, not because you necessarily think you can use them, but because you, you view it as a defense, uh, as the best next thing to an actual defense pact. The U.S. does not have a defense pact with the UAE, but if the UAE buys very sophisticated American weaponry, the United States develops an interest in making sure that the UAE does not lose wars that it's engaged in, and it becomes committed to UAE security because it's embarrassing for us if they use our weaponry, top of the art weaponry, and they lose. That's precisely why the United States is involved in Yemen. We don't have really a stake. Uh, in that conflict. But because the Saudis are using our weaponry, we are stuck with them in that war. That's what I think was behind it. These countries are terrified of the idea that the U.S. is going to leave. And in order for them to get the F-35s, which needed the Israelis to approve it because the Israelis have objected to any sales of sophisticated weaponry from the United States to um, um, uh, the Arab countries in the region, this deal was needed to be done. Again, it's not to say that Iran is not a factor. I think the real thing that is driving them together is the fear of the United States leaving the region. So um, with the few minutes that we have left, let's um, take a look at both best case scenarios. So in negotiation, knowing we have sort of a, a, a crunched timeline going forward, what would be the best case scenario and renegotiation for, for Iran and, and for the US? I think for both of them, uh, the best case scenario is that there's a way to quickly be able to communicate privately, create some sort of a mechanism for the United States and Iran to come back into compliance at the same time so that both sides can save face and then move quickly towards new negotiations. If we wait, then we will likely have a conservative president in Iran in June, who much like the conservative American president in 2016, ran on a platform of opposing the JCPOA. So we will not have the current situation in which both sides have uh, governments that want to go back in. We would once again have a situation in which one side um, uh, wants to go back, even though they're outside the U.S., and then one side that is inside but actually wants to leave. That's going to make the situation so much more complicated. There's absolutely no compelling reason to take that risk. It's so much better to move fast now and then also fast be able to address these other issues, Yemen, Syria, Persian Gulf security. So um, as a last question, Trita, so what do you think is the most likely thing to happen and what is your, your greatest hope for the future? That's a very profound question. <laughs> um, well, I think um, 
I think the best thing that could happen in my view is that uh, the deal is restored quickly and that we engage in serious negotiations and that the US shifts from a role in which it thinks that it needs to constantly side with strategic partners in the region to one of actually facilitating solutions. We are not and should not be a party to their own rivalry. Some of their rivalries are actually fueled by their desire to get the United States to get in, into those rivalries. Um, and if we can play the role of a peacemaker in the region or a facilitator, I think that would be so much better for the United States and it would be so much better for the region. But it requires a profound shift in our own definition of what our role should be. If you listen carefully to uh, a lot of politicians and policymakers in Washington, you often hear them say, we have to stand by our allies, as if that is in and of itself an objective interest of the United States, in which we have to just completely shut off our own cognitive capabilities and just blindly follow what our allies are doing. Many of our allies are not particularly great allies. They're extremely destructive. They have been extremely disruptive in the region from Yemen to many other things uh, that have happened. We should have a much more mature relationship with them and be able to use a word that we have seldom used with them, which is no. Thank you so much, Trita. There are so many more questions in the queue, which tells me that we're going to have to have you back at some point soon in the future. I so appreciate you spending some time with us today. Thank you so much for having me. This is such a critical global issue. I am so grateful and thankful to you. Happy to do it. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Trita, to echo Megan, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you everyone who joined in the conversation. As you know, this discussion is an event of the Council's State of the World series. Um, so coming up, we'll tackle everything from domestic terrorism uh, to global movements for civil rights and from China's new digital currency uh, to the coup in Myanmar. Uh, so we invite you to join us next week when we'll speak with Seamus Hughes on the development of domestic extremism in the US. Um, so to make sure you don't miss an episode, visit our website at ctwack.org, subscribe to our YouTube channel at World Affairs Council of Connecticut, and subscribe to the State of the World podcast on any, any place that you get your podcast, Google, Spotify, or Apple. Um, so once again, thank you so much for joining in this conversation. A huge thank you to Trita, and until next time.